Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christy Herrera, and I am Executive Director of the Alliance for Charitable Excellence at the Philanthropy Roundtable. The Alliance for Charitable Excellence, or as we like to call it, ACE, is a fairly new project here at the Roundtable. We exist to protect and defend and promote philanthropic excellence so that donors like you can invest in the causes that strengthen our communities, our states, and our country. One of the issues that we will explore through ACE is the intersection of diversity and philanthropy. And that's why we're here today for a provocative, and I hope a productive conversation about race, culture, and philanthropy, and how we can all effectively engage people with a different point of view. Leading that discussion is Ian Rowe, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and founder and CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools. Ian is the outgoing CEO of Public Prep, a network of public charter schools in the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Prior to joining Public Prep, Ian served as deputy director of post-secondary success at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and as an Emmy award-winning senior vice president of strategic partnerships and public affairs at MTV. Ian is a graduate of Harvard Business School where he was the first black editor of the Harbus, the Harvard Business School newspaper and Cornell University where he studied computer science engineering. If you haven't already seen Ian's op-ed, The Power of Personal Agency, which ran in the Wall Street Journal this past weekend. I invite you to read it. It's a very refreshing take on what's happening today. Joining Ian in our conversation is Irshad Manji. Irshad is Director of Cur Courage, Curiosity, and Character at Let Grow. She is the founder of the Moral Courage College and the best-selling author of the book, don't Label Me, How to Do Diversity Without Inflaming the Culture Wars. Irshad may be the most unlikely critic of our culture's modern obsession with demographic labels. She herself could be labeled a progressive or a feminist, among other descriptors, but in her book, Don't Label Me, she writes, more and more of us in the diversity crowd label people as ignorant and insidious if they hold opinions that diverge from our script. We rally for diversity of appearance, but flake on diversity of viewpoint. If you haven't seen Irshad's Time Magazine video that went viral last year, the video is called, It's Time to Teach Young People How to Stop Being So Offended. I encourage you to watch it. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I turn things over to Ian. Uh, please mute your line if you can. Also, after Ian and Irshad's conversation, we'll open it up for questions. If you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A icon so that you can submit your question. You can submit a question now or at any time during the webinar. Once it's time for q and I'll read the questions so that Ian and Irshad can respond. One last thing, we have turned on the chat function on the Zoom call, but we will not be monitoring it for Q&A. So with that, please help me welcome Ian Rowe and Irshad Manji. Ian, go ahead and take it away. Christy, thank you so much for that fantastic introduction, and thank you to the Philanthropy Roundtable for hosting what I believe will be a fantastic discussion on how to engage other viewpoints and opinions at a time when much of our country doesn't seem to want to do just that. And uh, so I'm very proud to be here. As Christy said, my name is Ian Rowe, and I'm honored to be joined by the amazing Irshad Manji, who is known for her audacity, nerve, boldness and conviction. Uh, I love that description. And soon Irshad and I will be having a conversation about why moral courage seems to be in such short supply and what we can all do to become more brave and engage in true constructive dialogue that improves the lives of young people and maybe might just help keep our country from ripping apart. As Christy said, for the last decade, I've run a network of public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 2,000 students, mostly uh, Black and Hispanic kids um, from low-income communities. I'm embarking upon a new effort uh, to run a network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools. But bottom line is, I run schools. And my student body 
it's critical that they learn that they have what I call individual agency, that their personal decisions and actions actually have a great influence over their life outcomes. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of grit, you know, which is relentless perseverance and pursuit of a goal, but one doesn't develop that dogged self-determination or grit if you don't believe that your efforts matter. Agency is the precursor to grit, and you can't have agency if you feel that in order for you to be successful, someone else who's responsible for your outcomes must act first. In the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, however, this dominant narrative has emerged that structural racism is the key factor holding black people down and that white people need to first give up their privilege in order for black people to succeed. Now, there's certainly still barriers, but what I thought was missing from this narrative, this dominant narrative, is the topic of black excellence and individual agency and the stories of millions of black people that are succeeding despite the odds. Yet in speaking to my colleagues, I noticed that people said, no, 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 we, we have to, they were self-censoring. Ian, you can't say these things in public because somehow a message of black independence might be construed that we're blaming the victim for their own challenges. That's why I wrote the op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And it was entitled The Power of Personal Agency. Despite very real racial barriers that are out there, there are millions of examples of black excellence. What can we learn from those who are pursuing the American dream? Those who are making decisions around education, work, marriage and children that are successful. There are many people who can benefit from that message, people of all races. This is a viewpoint that has to be shared. What's been refreshing is the feedback has been very positive. And folks saying, Ian, thank you for saying this out loud. And so my sense is there is a silent, perhaps majority of people who hold these views, but now are just feeling wholly intimidated at the current moment. And so I really, if one message uh, uh, emerges from this webinar, this idea that bravery begets bravery. I think the more that we exercise our moral courage, the more that we'll see others have the confidence to do the same. And Irshad, you have, um, you, are such, you are so exceptional on this point about the need for moral courage. How do you define it? And why is it in such short supply? And most importantly, how do we have more people develop the capacity to speak when needed? Okay, so those are three big questions. Ian. Uh, so I'm glad that you threw me some softballs right off the top. <laughs> um, first of all, hi, everybody. Um, and thank you again to the Philanthropy Roundtable for hosting both Ian and I. Um, so I uh, just quickly introduce myself in order to ease into answers to your questions, Ian. Uh, my name is Irshad Manji, and um, I am the director for Courage, Curiosity, and Character at Let Grow, which is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit uh, that promotes um, intellectual independence, thinking for yourself, and emotional resilience, uh, the strength to handle adversity and backlash, and sometimes even failure uh, among America's young people. Um, and in that capacity, I do work mostly with middle and high schoolers, um, people who are really forming an identity of their own, who are beginning to find their voice. And we want to ensure that this next generation of Americans finds the voice to communicate across lines of disagreement. Here's why. We are today living in a time um, when challenges are not just domestic, not just global, but in some cases, existential. We're living in a case like that right now in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, other existential issues would include mass migration, uh, climate change, um, the unintended consequences of automation uh, and artificial intelligence. All of these are highly, highly emotional issues. And if this next generation 
uh, is raised in the way, frankly, that I was, and I'm going to guess uh, in the way that you were educated as well, Ian, mm -hmm. meaning come up with solutions, you smart kids, and then make them happen. Well, that's not all there is to coming up with enduring solutions. You also have to know how to engage with people who disagree with you on those so-called solutions. Because if all you're doing is what our generation is doing right now, Ian, which is imposing answers on a whole swath of other people who don't buy in, then in fact, the needle doesn't move on any of these major problems. All that moves is the hamster wheel that of dogma. And it goes round and round and round with the noise amplifying and the cynicism deepening. And that is a mortal threat to our republic. So, so I'll just finish up the thought here that the key then to teaching young people how to communicate across lines of disagreement is the skill set known as moral courage. You ask me, what do I mean by moral courage? Moral courage quite simply means doing the right thing in the face of your fears. And today, the scariest thing to do at such a polarized time in our history is to engage with people with whom you disagree. Why is that so scary? Because of course, kids are mortified of being canceled, right? Of being told that they no longer exist, they're no longer relevant, you're out. And we've got to teach then not just those intrinsically motivated kids who see nuance and want to be able to ask questions and express their curiosity, but we've also got to be able to teach young people who have strong convictions and who would be in a position to cancel out the others. We've got to remind them of one singular truth. And this is where moral courage becomes very strategic and very self-enlightened. And it is this law of human psychology that we teach as part of moral courage at Let Grow. If you want to be heard, the law of psychology, human psychology tells us, you must first be willing to hear. So exercising moral courage is not just something that's nice. It's not just something that's civil. It is actually self, uh, you know, self enlightenment. And when we put it in those strategic terms, we have found that young people, you know, stand up and begin listening and then begin applying these lessons to their own lives. Uh, that's fantastic. The ability to listen is the first step. I, I just read a, uh, a tweet, you might find it uh, interesting, a, a person who is trying to figure these things out, this is their quandary. If I don't speak out, I'm racist, mm -hmm. right? Because silence is violence. If I do speak out, but I ask probing questions such as maybe there are other issues other than racism in this case, maybe something that's other than the prevailing narrative, that's racist. If I do speak out and I conform to the narrative, it's never enough, mm -hmm. right? So how in this, in this environment where you feel almost boxed in yep. that you have to do something, I can't be silent, but if I speak something, it's a minefield. How do you navigate this? First and foremost, let's acknowledge that this is a minefield, not just for young people, but for adults and perhaps especially for adults yeah. because they're um, typically not as immersed in the social media game as young people are. So the so-called rules can be that much more confusing, right? But what we teach um, at Let Grow as far as exercising your moral courage is to lay down uh, some basic rules of engagement before you even begin to engage. If you are open to having a conversation with someone who disagrees with you or you disagree with, first start with some ground, ground rules. Number one, I am not going to shame you. Can you agree not to shame me for being honest? Number two, I am going to listen. I'm going to give you the opportunity to speak your truth first. I will go first in the listening department. Will you then reciprocate with listening to my truth? And when the person who begins the conversation that way uh, takes the time to offer up those ground rules, something really interesting happens, Ian. We find 
that the person who goes first actually sets the tone and the culture of the conversation. So far from being a giving up of your power by listening and going first in the listening department, actually you are claiming your power because you're uh, setting the parameters for what the conversation is going to be. And I can tell you, I've written, I've written about this in my book, Don't Label Me. And I've got lots of, you know, data and, uh, and evidence to show through the work that I've been doing with moral courage in schools right across the country, that uh, taking the time to set these ground rules actually steers the conversation in a way that is productive and constructive. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to convince the other party of your point of view. Of course, it doesn't mean that. What it means, however, is that you are immediately lowering their emotional defenses, Absolutely. right? And, and that frees up their bandwidth to be able to hear your point of view in a way that they could have never before. Because before these ground rules, they would have been thinking of things like, hmm, yes, but, or, how do I, you know, how do I retort that point, right? Their minds, and this is very human, our minds are always looking to win rather than to understand. But if you make the point that you are here to understand, you give the other party the, the permission to do the same. And indeed, I, moral reciprocity follows. I absolutely agree. And, you know, in my own experience, I also, I like to come from a place of inquiry. Yeah. You know, listen. Is there a grain of truth in what someone is saying? Do you actually have the moral courage to accept the possibility that you could be wrong? That there are parts of your argument that are actually flawed. And I think for me, that's something I've really tried to embrace because none of us have all of the answers. Are you willing to change your opinion based on new information? Right. And respect, you know, respect the person and really hone in on the argument itself. Have you ever been canceled yourself? Um, you know, I tell you something. I, uh, first of all, it, prior to my latest book, uh, Don't Label Me, um, I had a full 20 years as an advocate of reform within my faith of Islam. In fact, some of our uh, participants today might remember my name, the face, or the nasally voice from having done a ton <laughs> of media in past lives about this very issue. And when I went in front of large audiences of my fellow Muslims to argue that we need to change ourselves if we are going to show that Islam means peace, let me tell you something. You want to talk cancellation? I'll tell you about cancellation, right? This was not something that people, you know, my fellow Muslims wanted to hear. But here's what I learned. I persisted. And what I learned was rather than just go up there, and make a statement and put my fists up and get ready to duke it out with them, I learned that if I state my case and then say, but I'm here to listen to you, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm missing something about where you're coming from. So let me now turn the floor over to you. Tell me what I'm missing. And when people understood that I was there to engage and not necessarily to win, that is when they trusted me enough to ask questions about where I was coming from as well. Yeah. And what wound up happening at one point after a big debate that I did on Al Jazeera TV is that a bunch of imams, which is the, you know, the, the Muslim equivalent of ministers, approached me. This was in London, right? Sorry, in, in Oxford, but in, but in Britain. Um, they approached me to say, look, we can't really say this out loud, but um, we believe that, you know, there's something to what you're saying. Would you be willing to meet with a bunch of us at that time, not Zoom, but via Skype? And indeed that, you know, that unfolded. So my point is this, if I was there just to, you know, crush the other side, yeah. I would have never received that invitation. I would have been speaking to the choir and a whole bunch of others who needed to come on board with the idea of Muslim reform would have simply turned their backs and walked away. But by taking the time to build trust, I was able to reach the most otherwise dis defensive members of my community. And in that way, 
was able to get my message heard. And that is something that we, you know, could really learn uh, to do more of in this country on all kinds of issues. Sure. And, and what do you think is the role of, of data and proportionality in these conversations? So, for example, you know, I often write about uh, a, uh, some research under the label of success sequence. And it's a series of decisions that many Americans have made that give them an incredible likelihood of economic success. And these are decisions that are in the control of individuals. And it's finish your high school degree, full-time work of any kind, marriage, then children, in that order. Mm -hmm. When Americans have made those decisions, 97% of people from any beginning economic class end up in the middle class or beyond. That's phenomenal information. And I've found it very useful mm -hmm. to actually have that kind of information that's typically not part of the dialogue that's more emotion driven right. than data driven. Right. So how do, you, how do you think about you know, injecting actual evidence into these kinds of conversations. Sure. And I think, uh, you know, your, your point about certain patterns uh, holding um, uh, is an incredibly important one. That's part of where the credibility of your argument would come from. Let's remember, though, timing is everything, or at least a lot of everything, <laughs> right? If you start off with stats, I know. Um, you're never going to get much further. Precisely because of what you enunciated moments ago, the word emotion. Like it or not, we human beings think first and foremost emotionally. And uh, from a biological standpoint, the easiest emotion to have is fear. Where our brains, our primal brains, are constantly scanning for threats. That is why taking the time to build trust and not be a threat to the other party is so important to the strategy of being heard. Later, once they have reciprocated your trust in them with yeah. trust in you, that is when you can ask a question. Namely, tell me, Ian, if you are the other party, um, <laughs> what do you think is the role of statistics and data in a conversation like this? Do you, do you think that research should matter? Asking that question or a question like it puts the ball of accountability back in the court of the person you're engaging. And here's the key, by gleaning where they are coming from, you're able then to get more information about what they value so that ultimately you can reframe your argument in a way that finally has a shot of being heard. So, Two important things. Number one, save your stats and data for later in the conversation. Build trust first by bringing emotional defenses down. And number two, rather than merely state your research, ask first, what role should research play sure. in what we're talking about today? Yeah, and I often find, uh, I think you're right. You first have to put yourself, you know, reveal some vulnerability yourself. I often share my own experiences of being a black male in, the in this country and challenges I've faced, to say that I'm not completely dismissing the arguments that you're saying, but let's just talk proportionality. So for example, obviously the George Floyd killing has highlighted a terrible example of an unarmed black person being killed by police. 23 times that happened in the United States in 2018. But in that same year, there are more than 3 million College, black college students and, and in graduate students. And I find that after you, after you do reveal that you, you acknowledge that this was a terrible incident, every one of those situations should be prosecuted. You share your individual stories of what it's meant to be successful. And then you share this data. Hopefully then there is, a, there is a, some kind of light bulb that says maybe there's another perspective here that I haven't thought about. And that's where I think data can be very effective. Uh, agreed. And I'll quickly add, by the way, that uh, the approach that, uh, you know, that we've both just uh, expressed right now, which is, uh, you know, create the bond first, uh, and then resort to the so-called, you know, facts and, and, and evidence, um, is interestingly a method that was even taught by uh, the martial arts master and, as it turns out, the philosopher, Bruce Lee. He would teach his own students be like water. 
What did he mean by that? He meant this. Water always gets to where it needs to be, not by crashing up against the rocks, but by swirling around them, washing over them, uh, seeping through them. In other words, you've got to have the patience to suss out where your opponent, which is not to say your enemy, we're not talking about enemies here, but your rivals, your opponents are coming from in order then to get the big picture of where it is their vulnerabilities are so that you can then speak to those vulnerabilities. Um, by the way, the reason all of this takes moral courage on the part of the speaker and not just the part of the listener in any given case is that uh, we too are human, you and I, and let's face it, we therefore have egos as well. And the easiest thing to do if you say something that I disagree, the, disagree with is to say, no, 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 you're wrong and here's why. And then to try and go in to win, right? But moral courage on my part means that I have to tame my ego. I have to acknowledge that you have experiences and perspectives that, as you say, may very well be legitimate given your circumstances. So it behooves me to hear what your circumstances are and therefore ask more questions so that you know I'm hearing you and only after you know I'm hearing you then take the opportunity to express where I'm coming from. Um, that is how, uh, and by bringing Bruce Lee into it, so many of the young people whom we work with through Let Grow, uh, that is how they realize, you know, that this isn't just about like being civil. It's civil civility is nice, but if we're talking about coming to a knife fight, you know, civility may get you killed. No, what this kind of moral courage does is it brings uh, a much more, um, a much sharper, meaning more clever weapon to the table. You literally outwit those who would otherwise not be willing to give you a fair hearing. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that's so um, sort of explosive right now is the issue of, of, of race. And do you think these same rules apply? I mean, we are, quote unquote, people of color, right? Yeah. And maybe that gives us a certain level of freedom or tolerance to say things that someone that's white may not feel the same. Do you think the rules are the same for a white person that wants to engage in these, in these topics and these kind of conversations? Um, uh, you know, prior to this latest wave of anti-racism protests, I would have said, no, the rules are not different. So, excuse me, the rules are different. That you and I can, quote, get away with what we want to say exactly because we are not white. But I think we are now living in an even more different time uh, than prior to these latest anti-racism protests. And I'll tell you why. The fact that uh, I am brown and not black uh, means that um, to many people, um, my voice <clears throat> should not count for as much. Uh, and by many people, I mean many anti-racism activists. Um, and believe anti -black, me, anti-black racism. Yeah. Right, precisely. Now, I, I try, Ian, to practice what I preach, and I have sat and listened to many people who have made the case to me for why Black voices must be prioritized today. Um, I understand that this country, in particular, has a, a different history with African Americans than many other countries have to their own minorities. I get that. That being said, I often then, again, in the you know, uh, uh, sort of method of asking questions, I then turn around and, and ask, um, is it possible, folks, that you are doing to other people of color and to white people exactly what was done to you? Namely, that um, you talk about you know, being colonized, right? Uh, and the early colonists of this republic, you know, putting white men on top and everybody else was assigned a particular value underneath them. Today, it seems to me, and maybe I'm missing something, but it seems to me that you're flipping that hierarchy on its head, that black people are on top and everybody else is underneath with white straight men being at the very bottom. Can I ask you, um, does payback, really equal progress? 
for some people, the answer to that question might be yes. It, and it might be yes. And that is when I sit and I listen further and then I engage further. So instead of, again, going in there to, 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 to assert, right, that this is why you're wrong, this is why you're a hypocrite, and this is why I can't sign on, I'm able, through taming my own ego, to uh, give them the kind of hearing that they would have never gotten from somebody on my side of the issue. And I have been in such you know, conversations where not only has the temperature lowered, but they've walked away and come back to me to say, I never thought about it that way. You've given me something new to chew on. We, we are, uh, we are going to soon go into question and answer. Um, so please submit your questions. But I also have to ask, you know, what if you're actually down with the program? What if you really, you know, you agree, the, the, you agree with the diagnosis, the real issues, but you genuinely disagree with the prescription that the opposite side may be providing? So for example, abolishing the police, or defunding the police, right. creating an autonomous zone in <laughs> your own city. Right. right. These are somewhat radical ideas. And what if you genuinely believe that will actually hurt the very people that we're all claiming that we're advocating for. Mm -hmm. Somehow that puts you on the other side. And for some people, they may just say, you know what, I'm just not going to engage. Yep. And how do we, how do we provide that person the, the wind beneath the wings that it's okay? Demonstrate that you concur. I, I, Black Lives Matter, yes. Yep. But there are other things than that solution that might actually be better, better. And in fact, that solution may hurt the very people we're talking about. Sure. So um, you can't win them all, Ian. That's for darn sure. And by the way, that means they haven't won you over either. So for them too, you can't win them all, right? But here's the point. Um, before you know who is worth your time to engage, you have to first engage. Absolutely. If you are assuming that they're kooks, they're conspiracy theorists, they're, you know, uh, militant um, uh, separatists, whatever the case may be, that's an assumption. And your assumption may very well be wrong. Look, I'll briefly tell you, um, you know, one of my own students, a young woman named Genesis, um, is a uh, hip hop artist, African American, uh, grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, one day in New York City, um, she, uh, you know, uh, protested the Confederate flag in a very inflammatory way. She spoke to her crowd. She got her, the, the adulation from the crowd right in front of her and then a ton of hate mail from all kinds of people afterwards uh, who saw a viral video of her, you know, making that inflammatory protest. But because of the class that I taught on moral courage, she decided to invite one person <clears throat> whom she remembered from her childhood, but whom she had not spoken a word to in 25 years. He wrote as part of that stream of, you know, uh, feedback that she got. He wrote to say, I totally disagree with you. I don't want you dead, but I totally disagree with you. She invited him to her backyard to sit down and talk. And you know, the question she asked him right away was the very first thing she said as part of the conversation. Tell me, how that flag makes you feel. Right. It, not an intellectual question, a question from the heart. And because Ian, she asked him that question, he then asked her that question. And what he realized by engaging with her and she with him is that he wound up caring more about her than he did about that flag. Now he is one of her heartiest supporters. And so the point I'm making is, it would have been very easy to look at someone like him. Red beard, dusty ball cap, Confederate flag flying in, the back, in his backyard, no longer, but back then, and say, that dude is a racist. I have nothing to say to him. Imagine if Genesis had reached that premature conclusion because she let her ego think for her, um, she would have left change on the table. Excellent. Okay. Well, I could go on there, but we are, we would love to invite uh, the audience to uh, uh, provide us some questions and make this more of an interactive session. So Christy, do we have some questions that have come in? 
we have some great questions. And so we'll see if we can get through as many of them as we can. Um, first question, what are your thoughts on trying to have productive conversations around race online? When social media makes it challenging to engage in the back and forth strategy, you're encouraging, which is a wonderful strategy. Uh, well, I'll say it, it's very difficult. I, I very much uh, do not engage because it's, in my view, it's ultimately unproductive to, to speak in sound bites of 140 to 280 characters is I think self-defeating. Uh, I try to find other ways. For, for example, when I write my essays, I first of all, I try to really lay out what I think because these are nuanced arguments and it's very difficult to achieve that. So in my own life, literally, uh, last Friday night, I brought a group of seven black fathers together to sit on my porch, socially distanced, um, <laughs> But we had a real conversation about what are we telling our own children? What can we do in our own community that's real? Um, and we, we are now starting this group that's gonna be getting together on a regular basis and we're reaching out to a, a few local schools to demonstrate the role that we as black fathers, um, you know, to be living embodiments of what we think uh, our kids can aspire to so I think the online, um, as much as I love Steve Jobs and others, <laughs> the online vehicle for these kinds of conversations, I think, is, is, can be very debilitating. Um, so I, I would strongly suggest finding in-person solutions, particularly in your home community. I would like to disagree. Okay. Um, <laughs> if only because I work with kids all the time, I do immerse myself in their world. And I engage on social media a lot. Not ridiculous. I don't have that kind of time, thank you. But enough to know what's being said and how it's being said. And um, I have found that applying some of the lessons that we've just talked about, Ian, to the online world actually does work. For example, uh, when I'm, you know, when I encounter something really rude in my feed, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, Instagram is actually a nice culture. It's uh, Twitter or uh, Facebook. <laughs> I always first say, um, thank you for asking. Great question. Um, I go into my answer and then I typically uh, end it off with a question for the person who's just blasted me. And uh, I give them two rounds to engage with me. If I find that it's going really well and I'm actually really interested, I'll actually suggest that we take it offline and you know, would that person be okay with me giving them a call? Some of my really close friends have been made that way actually. But, and yes, I do need to get out more. Um, but, um, <laughs> but other times when it's obviously not going along productively, I say, I'm gonna give you the last word, make it good. And I always stick to my promise to have them take the last word, no matter how tempting it is to respond. And one final thing, I end off always with saying, thank you for engaging. It's amazing how often just that phrase, thank you for engaging, in the first round, right up to the last round, matters for people to hear that. Because they're expecting you, to, again, to counterpunch 10 times harder. When you surprise them with your dignity, their emotional defenses typically go down. Okay, all right. So I'll slightly amend my uh, statement around uh -huh. online engagement, which is that I would strongly encourage folks not necessarily to engage in a tit for tat, but right. read, read nuanced explanations or arguments from the other side. Go to websites that your, all your friends would say, what is it, you, you, how can you possibly be reading content from those sites and read them. Why does the other side, why do multiple sides, why do they believe what they believe? And what I've done actually in multiple instances, I've reached out to people who I believe have had very thoughtful arguments that go against mine. And I've actually been pleasantly surprised that when engaged on that level of sort of, you know, I read what you said, I, I disagree, but I'd really love to understand where you're coming from. I think that's a very powerful and the online environment does provide the opportunity to find those kinds of people that otherwise would be very difficult to find. 
Thanks to everyone for your questions. And just a reminder, um, if you click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, type your question and we can get to it. Um, next question, did you adopt the BLM hashtag? Why or why not? Not inflammatory at all, that question. Go ahead. <laughs> right, uh, I did not. You know, what's, in, what's interesting is that, um, so I run charter schools, uh, which I believe are a very uh, important um, uh, tool in the arsenal of how we create opportunities for young people across the country of all races. The Black Lives Matter organization, actually their platform is to issue a moratorium on charter schools because somehow they believe that charter schools are working in, in opposition of the interests of low-income Black kids. I disagree with that. I would love to have a nuanced conversation with the leadership of Black Lives Matter uh, why they believe that, especially when, when you speak to many of the folks on our wait list. For example, our wait list uh, in the Bronx alone has close to 5,000 families who are desperate for a great education for their children, but the best we could do is put their name on a really long wait list. And the vast majority of those 5,000 families are Black and Hispanic. And so for me, there's slogans that it's, I think it's very easy to sort of sign on to, but when you get into the substance of what is actually going to improve the lives of kids, that's a very different discussion. And I'd really love to have a more nuanced conversation without doing what I call in many cases, the virtue signaling of someone posts that and they feel they've got cover, um, but it actually hasn't really changed um, things. And in fact, if there were a moratorium on charter schools, that actually hurts the very populations of kids that we're seeking to serve. I agree, Ian. Um, many of the so-called policies uh, that uh, Black Lives Matter promotes are, are non-starters. Uh, in fact, they're dead enders uh, for the people who, you know, they, they claim to be, uh, whose lives they claim to value. Uh, that being said, in answer to the question, I do and have adopt the BLM hashtag in part because I want to reach the people um, you know, who use that hashtag as well. Um, and I don't see it uh, for me as a contradiction of my message, but here's why. Um, what I tend to post on social media is counterintuitive to what most people who use that hashtag would see. For example, there's this very, very famous within social justice circles activist, uh, deceased now, but uh, she lived in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Her name was Audra Lord. She was uh, African-American, she was black, she was a poet. And one of her famous um, uh, uh, quotes is um, that we are all blessed in some way and that it is up to us to recognize our blessings, to recognize our privileges, and to use them for a greater good. I posted that not too long ago on social, using her exact words, and I pointed out, I'm working for the day when, um, you know, when before telling other people to check their privilege or own their privilege, that we who do that kind of lecturing will own up to the privileges that we have. What I'm saying, therefore, is that um, I've got my eye on you, BLM crowd. I'm not going to let you get away with hypocrisy. I'm going to use the very icons whom you claim to uphold. I'm going to use what they have said in a way that gets you thinking rather than keeps you smug about your point of view. And once again, a ton of engagement on something like this exactly because it was provocative but because of that engagement, there were a lot more people who came to appreciate that, okay, maybe there's more nuance to this than I gave it credit for. That's a great question. It's a little long, so I'll read it all. Um, I love the suggestion about setting ground rules up front for difficult conversations. Unfortunately, not everyone participating in cancel culture is willing to engage in these sorts of ground rules. For example, advocacy groups who feel that anyone who does not agree with their approach to addressing an issue is the enemy. These groups are known for trying to publicly cancel groups and individuals. Is there a fair, polite way to publicly refute or respond to criticism from groups like this that are not willing to engage in a productive discussion. Not to stoke conflict, but just to share with the bystanders the reality of the situation. 
Could I, could I jump right into that first? Sure. Um, so I noticed that the, that the uh, uh, questioner uh, uses the phrase advocacy groups, and the word groups was used more than once in that, in that question. I want to be clear that when you're engaging with an individual or even a set of individuals, you're not necessarily engaging with the entire group. That's really important to understand because it's easy to assume that if somebody is an activist, let's say in Black Lives Matter, that you're uh, trying to appeal to that group. No, you're not. There are many individuals in that group. What you're doing is speaking to one individual and they may or may not be representative of that group. So recognize that you're actually doing something much more productive than you would give yourself credit for doing if you thought it's the entire group I'm engaging with, right? I'll just say one other thing about all of this because it's, um, I think it illustrates the point. So you mentioned, Christy, that I could easily be labeled a progressive and certainly my, my politics tend to be a lot more liberal than, you know, than, than um, people who take the point of view that I do on BLM. I, in my book, uh, I uh, tell the story of a wonderful relationship, relationship I have with a very strident Republican. He actually is my father figure. Um, he lives in California. And um, there have been times when he has spouted at me the kind of talking points that say a Rachel Maddow would spout from her, from her perch on MSNBC. And I've had to take him by the shoulders, his name is Jim. I've had to take him by the shoulder and say, Jim, who are you talking to right now? Are you talking to Rachel Maddow? Or are you talking to Irshad Manji? Remember who you're talking to. I don't buy into all of that garbage that you've just told me about. So let's put all of that aside because you know that's not where I'm at. Talk to me like you know me so we can actually discuss what's relevant between you and me, right? Same thing, folks. Talk to individuals and don't assume right off the bat that they are the group because you might find they're actually a lot more nuanced than that. Uh, there, there not only may be more nuanced, they also, as you said, may not actually be rep representing all the people in the group that they right. claim they're advocating for. You know, what I, again, what I try to do in those situations is, what do I actually believe? If, if these folks are canceling me out, do I now just self-censor and, and take myself outside of the engagement? The answer is no. Put pen to paper. What is it you believe? Do you actually concur with the concerns of these quote advocacy groups? Where is your point of agreement? And then where's your point of departure? Do you believe that there's, there are opportunities to improve policing in this country? Say that, acknowledge it. Maybe there's a point of connection there and then lay out your, uh, you know, lay out your prescription and why. So at least there's clarity on what we're actually talking about. What I often find is that people are just completely talking past each other. They're operating on assumptions and they have no actual idea of what either, per either party stands for. I'm a big fan of write down your thoughts. For me, I, I can't really make sense of things until I've challenged myself on paper and then put it out into the world. I think that's a very good practice to pursue. And remember, people, uh, just because cancel culture exists doesn't mean you have to accept it. Exactly. You can always say, I'm canceling cancel culture and, 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 and proceed, as Ian just suggested. Yeah, and don't cede your power because right. a lot of the cancel don't give it culture, away. they win when you cancel yourself. That's right. Right? The, That's right. This is where moral courage is really important. It's yeah. the only way we're going to hold our country together. In this sense, silence is consent. Silence is violence. Uh, next question. It's two questions actually that are related. Um, how do you effectively distinguish between BLM the idea and BLM the movement? Um, and how do you respond to assertions of systemic racism? Well, I think I, I'm happy to take them. Again, I think again, as a Black person, I can sh surely share surely share um, my experiences uh, facing racial discrimination. It is true. Um, every, every person has a range of challenges that they face in their life. The question is, are these challenges so huge that you are immobilized? 
are there examples of people who have faced all sorts of racism, other challenges in life? You know, life is unfair. You know, you're going to face barriers based on race, class, gender. You might be short, you might be tall, you might be attractive, you might be not attractive. You know, not that I'm saying equating racism to these other things. I'm not doing that. But what I'm saying is what we have to do, particularly for young people, is get back to this idea of agency, that you are going to face inevitable barriers in your life. What can you learn from other people who face those same exact challenges and have proven successful? What are the decisions that they made in their lives? What is it that we can learn from them? That's an important part of the dialogue because if we keep pushing the idea that structural racism is this heavy weight on your life and you're gonna get killed while jogging or, you know, or any of these things, you are, you are immobilized. At some point you start to say, why bother? The very last thing we can have for our young people is this feeling of powerlessness. And for me, that's why it's so important that we speak out in these moments where the dominant narrative is that Black people in particular don't have opportunity because of, because of systemic racism, when there are millions of real stories of people who've countered that. Yes, and uh, one of the things I like to point out to, to the young people I work with is uh, you may be less powerful, but that is not the same as being powerless. That's why agency really matters. Um, and the other, you know, of course there's systemic racism. There, of course, I've experienced it. But let's question, what is a system? Is a system something completely abstract and therefore we have we there's nothing we can do to tackle it you know other than tear down the country no systems structures institutions are nothing more than the people who inhabit them these things don't speak for themselves we the people who, in, who inhabit them speak for systems and structures and institutions which is why it's how we treat one another that makes anything systemic. That is why working with other individuals, role modeling the moral courage that Ian and I have been talking about, engaging in understanding rather than just labeling, that is what uh, digs the rot out of any system. So remember, systems are not abstractions. The system is us. And for the system to be reformed, we, have to change ourselves. So we've gotten this question in a number of forms, so I'll, I'll read one of them to you. How can and should we embrace diversity in the philanthropic sector? There's a lot of talk about foundations looking like the people they are helping. Do you think that this is the most important metric for charitable organizations to consider? Well, what's interesting about that question is you use the word diversity without a uh, uh, an adjective in front of it. I presume when people are asking that question, they mean racial diversity as opposed to viewpoint diversity. And there's certainly, you know, benefit in having a racially, socioeconomically diverse uh, population of folks that work at foundations that are not necessarily reflective in terms of quotas, but in terms of experience. But what I find is viewpoint diversity is is more so what's missing from these communities. We cannot, uh, these problems are um, extremely complex and I think the solutions are, that are, are as complex. And what I don't want to happen is that organizations, and you've seen this in the higher education space, dramatic, you know, move to let's create the office of diversity and inclusion. They'll they, you know, find a non-white person to lead that. And again, it becomes cover for um, for a supposed now investment, but the results don't always play out that way. And so I would just be very focused on non-superficial changes um, and that viewpoint diversity, I think is the most constructive thing that foundations should focus on. You know, and again, what are your core values? What do you believe? Is hiring someone who's uh, racially diverse going to change your um, 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 you know, your mode of giving, maybe it should, but it shouldn't be just because they are of a certain race or they're of a certain background. Do their arguments 
uh, align with your values? Do their prescriptions actually represent the long-term interests of the people that you're advocating for? These are challenging questions because right now we're not necessarily seeing solutions that have proven to be successful. And so our readiness to be open to take new kinds of solutions should be the real um, barometer for me. And that for me, that includes viewpoint diversity, maybe even more, maybe even more importantly than racial diversity. Um, Chrissy, I'll simply add, uh, this is one of the questions that I addressed in depth in an interview that I did with the Philanthropy Roundtable magazine uh, last year. And you might actually uh, want to make that link available to participants uh, to that interview um, after this webinar. Uh, but I'll quickly add um, that uh, we need to distinguish, Ian is absolutely right, we need to distinguish between at least two types of diversities. Here's how I would put it. There is such a thing as honest diversity, and then there's such a thing as dishonest diversity. Dishonest diversity slices and dices individuals and stuffs them into categories and leaves them there as if to say, welcome to your assigned place. <laughs> honest diversity engages individuals and treats people as individuals, not as avatars or mascots of this or that tribe. So the next time, uh, folks, anybody suggests to you that you really don't believe in diversity, here's a question to ask them. Uh, what kind of diversity are you talking about? Do you mean honest diversity, which is about understanding and engaging? Because I'm very much in favor of that kind of diversity. Or do you mean dishonest diversity? which is only about labeling. Because in that case, you're right. I'm not interested in that kind of diversity. And frankly, you shouldn't be either. Um, we have about three minutes left. So I'll ask a final question and then turn it over to you both for some closing remarks and I'll wrap it up if that sounds good. Um, what can a funder do? Michelle? So uh, I would, of course, love for uh, the participants of this forum and beyond uh, to consider supporting Let Grow, uh, where I serve as the director for Courage, Curiosity, and Character. And that's also where uh, we are building uh, a program for schools right across the country, public uh, as well as charter um, and independent. And that program is called Moral Courage College. Um, you know, which teaches uh, middle and high schoolers um, to uh, be less offended uh, by ideas that they don't immediately believe in um, and to ask questions and discuss tough topics without the fear of being canceled. Um, and the reason we're so passionate about this is that, um, uh, you know, we, we know that society simply cannot move forward and democracy cannot be deepened, or for that matter, in some cases, restored without the skills. And these are skills. These are not just attributes. These are actual skills that can be taught to a new generation, but they're not getting it immediately from their teachers or for that matter, even their parents, because their teachers and their parents were never taught this either. So at the moment, we're creating an online course that we will be scaling for teachers right across the country to teach moral courage, especially when it comes to highly emotional issues like racism and anti-racism. Uh, ultimately though, you know, I think the point to make here is that um, you know, Let Grow has a strategy for scaling uh, this work um, and these lessons. And uh, if you believe uh, that a new generation is capable of learning these things and indeed must learn them um, in order to correct the mistakes that my and Ian's generation have imposed upon them, uh, I would love for you to get in touch with me. Uh, the Philanthropy Roundtable will be posting our contact information and, uh, and particularly if there are any schools in the country uh, that you think you could um, connect us to and uh, support us in bringing our work to them, uh, we'd be doubly grateful for that. Uh, uh, this is about scaling the impact of the work nationally. And Christy, how much time do you have? Um, we're at three o'clock, but go ahead. Well, the, uh, well, I'll wrap up. Uh, I'll do both my closing statement and, and answer what funders can do. Certainly um, uh, invest in charter schools, uh, invest in the one institution that in many communities across the country um, provides educational opportunity for kids. 
There are also great organizations like 1776 Unites, which is a, a group of, of primarily Black uh, scholars and activists who risen up in response to the 1619 project and providing an alternative view of the possibility of America. And I think it's really important to support organizations that are trying to demonstrate a different viewpoint for how Black Americans can be successful in our country. And just in, in terms of my closing, and Irshad, please uh, follow me, but I came across a quote from de Tocqueville uh, that he uh, wrote many years ago. And he said, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults, unquote. I've always found that statement compelling because it resonates with the notion that America is always in pursuit of becoming a more perfect union. And while the founders did lay out these inspiring ideals, we are in a constant effort as a country to live up to them. But what that is dependent on is civil discourse, constructive disagreement. And at this moment in our nation's history, in which the silencing of ideas seems to be the status quo, we need people like us to stand up and speak up. Listen to people who disagree with you. Don't label them. Is there a grain of truth in what they're saying? But then, and whatever you do, don't receive. But then speak your truth. Live your values. That's what this country needs to survive and thrive. And I really just hope everyone, at least from this webinar, recognizes the importance of moral courage at this moment in time. And thank you very much for listening. And Irshad, um, I'd love to give you the, the final word. I'm done. Thank you all so much. Look forward to hearing from some of you. Yes. Thanks to you. I, my information as well. Please, please feel free, feel, feel free uh, to reconnect, to connect. Thank you. Yes, we have um, posted the uh, emails, personal emails for Ian and Irshad on the chat, and I will include them uh, with all of you. Go ahead, Irshad, did you want to? Yeah, just what uh, I see the, um, the uh, information that's been posted about me. Uh, it's irshad at letgrow.org, dot org. We've missed the dot org in that information. Got it, okay. Yep. Um, feel free to continue the conversation and continue the Q&A with Ian and Irshad um, after the call. I hope you have enjoyed this hour. Ian and Irshad, thank you for your time and your talent. Uh, thank you. Um, for those of you who want to contact them personally, uh, you can also reach out to me. I'd be happy to connect you. Um, to all of, all of you that are joining us today, thank you so much for listening for the past hour. Um, to learn more about the work of the Roundtables Alliance for Charitable Excellence, you can visit charitableexcellence.org and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.